But, okay, hi. I'm Helena Price. I'm a photographer based here in San Francisco. And tonight I'm going to talk to you about my most recent project called Techies. I am going to assume that most of you here have seen the project, so I'm not going to go super, super detailed into it, but I am going to give you some background on why I did it in the first place, take you through some of the highlights, and then offer some tips for how you can apply your own skills to help make an impact in the industry. So first off, one of my favorite things about these talks is everyone is here because they can relate to this project in some way. Um, people are here because their paths might be unconventional or they come from a place where you wouldn't expect a techie to come from or people have been feeling really isolated in the industry up until this point. So all of you are here for common reasons and it's been amazing and so rewarding to watch people connect at these events. So I hope that you guys take the time to connect with each other beyond what you just did and hang out and make some new friends tonight. Also, if you'd like to hang out even more, Mark your calendars for next Wednesday, June 22nd, when we're going to do a huge launch party for the project, kind of like a grand finale event at LinkedIn's brand new gigantic headquarters lobby. It's really pretty. Uh, I'd recommend grabbing a ticket in advance, but you can also just show up and buy one at the door. And you can find a link to that on basically any social media on the screen because I'm posting about it all the time. Um, and there are several folks from Techies here tonight. Would you please stand so I can see you and everyone can see you? Yay! Hi, guys. Awesome. So they are the reason that this project exists. And after the fact, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to chat for a little bit, and then I'm going to bring them on stage so that you guys can do a Q&A with all of us if you have questions for me or if you have questions just generally for people in the project or even a specific person you can ask. And I'm going to leave quite a bit of time for this, so brainstorm your questions. Don't be afraid to ask anything, and don't be afraid to use this as an opportunity to share your own experiences as well. So let's start at the beginning and go into the inspiration for doing this project in the first place. Over the years, when you've heard the word techie, what comes to mind? Just think about it. For many, it's probably someone like this. He was probably exposed to technology at an early age, either through his parents or his early education. He probably went to Stanford. He's probably working at Google or Facebook or Uber or Airbnb, or maybe he's a startup CEO. And according to the internet, he's probably white male and somewhere between 20 and 40. The story and image of this techie is celebrated over and over and over. You see him in the press. You see him winning awards. You see him raising venture capital. But there is another story in tech that is not being told. It's of another kind of techie. They don't come from privilege. They probably didn't go to Ivy League schools. Maybe they came from poverty or rough homes. They probably didn't have access to technology in early childhood, but when they discovered it, they worked against all odds to get to Silicon Valley. They overcame unimaginable obstacles and made careers for themselves despite everybody telling them they couldn't. They are also now working at Facebook and Google and Uber and Airbnb and running companies and building the products that we love. And they are sitting in this room right now. But we don't really hear about them. Their stories are not usually heard or celebrated. They also happen to be hired less, paid less, promoted less, and funded less than that first kind of techie. They experience bias, discrimination, and harassment based on their gender, race, age, or sexuality or simply not being a culture fit with the valley. You may have heard that before. How did I know that these techies existed? I know because I was one. So I've lived in San Francisco for seven years, and I worked in tech for four of them before getting fed up and leaving the industry. Since then, I built a career as an editorial, commercial, and portrait photographer with a large percentage of my work being focused on Silicon Valley. As someone who worked in tech, I never felt like I fit in. I grew up in a tiny town in North Carolina where most people don't leave. I barely graduated from college. It was not Ivy League. I didn't know Silicon Valley existed until I was 20. Uh, I moved to San Francisco with no personal network and no financial safety net. And I, oh yeah, and I landed my first startup job through a stranger in a coffee shop that I found by Googling coffee shops that techies hang out at. <laughs> <laughs> um, I spent my time in tech meeting tons and tons of amazing people and learning a million valuable skills that I can apply to my business today, but I also felt really isolated while I worked in tech. I tended to be surrounded by 
white dudes, no offense, and like millionaires and Ivy Leaguers who really didn't tend to value me or take me as seriously because I wasn't like them. And little did I know at the time, there were other kinds of techies out there also feeling isolated and years later they would be the focus of my work. Fast forward to today. Tech is in a very weird place right now. In 2016, the word techie is not being met with the same admiration it once had. The term has become loaded, even derogatory. It has become synonymous with privilege and greed. Within the industry, conversations around diversity and inclusion have risen to a boil. And at the same time, many in the industry view these issues with skepticism or dismiss them altogether. They believe that tech is a meritocracy, and if you can't figure out how to benefit from it, that is a fault of your own. So a few months ago, I decided to do a project exploring all of this. In the first three months of 2016, I set out to collect the stories of 100 people in the tech industry. I focused on folks whose stories are less told, those of women, people of color, LGBT, over 50, disabled, and so on. I wanted to learn where they come from, the obstacles they overcame to get here, the hardships they continue to face in the industry day to day, and why they choose to stay. I put a call for subjects out on Medium, and over 500 people applied in two weeks. Three months and over 1,000 hours of work later, the result was the Techies Project. Of the 100 people I interviewed and photographed, 70 were women and 59 were people of color, 25 were LGBT, 23 were immigrants, and 18 grew up in extreme poverty. Most of these folks have never been in the press, and many were sharing their experiences for the first time ever. I met folks like Nancy Duyong. She was raised in a community of illegal immigrants and eventually put in foster care. She was brilliant but depressed and almost failing out of school. She discovered tech as a teenager when strangers noticed her potential and introduced her to the computer clubhouse at MIT. I didn't want to do computer science. I didn't think I could write. I grew up in the hood. I didn't, I didn't have good grades. I had the third lowest GPA in high school out of just pure depression. It wasn't because I was smart, right? And here these people at MIT are saying, Nancy, you got this. You've got to like come to MIT. Come to MIT. I can't get to MIT, right? Let alone code because, I mean, these folks are making it sound like it's like a man's job. She now travels the world doing UX research for Google. Everett Karibak, who grew up surrounded by gangs and crime, and at 21 had a kid, a music degree, and no plans of being in tech. But eight years ago, even though everyone he knew discouraged him, he took a chance on an opportunity to build out the brand of a little tech company called Facebook. At Facebook, like I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I knew that I'd be focusing on communication design and more of the, the brand aspects of it, but I don't even think we knew what that was at Facebook. And, and again, it was like still early in my career. So like I didn't have any kind of formulated opinions on it. So it's kind of like this perfect storm of like, just go with your gut and see what happens. February Keeney, the engineering manager for the community and safety team at GitHub, who spent her first decade in tech presenting as male and when she transitioned, became aware of the privilege she lost. I mean, when I was trying to figure things out and just sort of living in a sort of genderqueer life mm -hmm. and I needed to find a different job and sort of being determined, like, I don't want to go any place that won't accept me as I am. Mm -hmm. And so presenting very genderqueer in interviews and not getting any offers. Mm -hmm. And then finally one day just being like, fine, no nail polish, no lip gloss, button tie shirt tie, just present as male as possible. And lo and behold, that I got an offer. Quite literally, every time I've been brought in for an on-site interview, my entire career and presented mail, I've got an offer. And Michelle Morrison, who actually co-hosts Designers and Geeks but couldn't make it tonight, who grew up on welfare and never earned a college degree, who hustled her way from Lori's Diner to Apple, spent five years growing Square from tiny startup to IPO, and now builds software for those in poverty at IDEO.org. I think as a young woman in America, I have had life-changing opportunities because of tech. I went from being on welfare as a kid, that level of citizenship, to building technologies that are used globally for anyone who wants to like engage in commerce. And like, it changed my worldview. It's changed my skill set. I can code, I can write copy, I can design <laughs> interfaces, I can launch international campaigns. I can, I can do so much now for the world that I couldn't do before, so I've learned a lot. 
And it's allowed me to really focus on what I value for better or for worse. And my priorities now are enabling other women and spending money and time and energy on things that I care about. Poor people just don't have that luxury. So a couple of weeks ago, I spoke at the Code Conference about techies alongside people, just people like Bill and Melinda Gates and Sheryl Sandberg and Elon Musk and Jack Dorsey, uh, to an audience of world leaders and top executives, mostly like 45-year-old white guys in blazers. And this is what I asked them. I'm going to ask you to get uncomfortable, to consider the idea that tech is not the meritocracy that you think it is. And despite the obvious talent and intelligence you all possess in this room, perhaps there are greater systems at work that helped you get to where you are, and that these same systems hold back people who aren't like you. That there are extraordinary people working in Silicon Valley, many at companies you created, contributing to the cognitive diversity of your teams and enabling you to build products for global audiences who are being underestimated or ignored based on assumptions about their potential that these people are putting up with it for now because they love technology, they're activated by the work they do, and they want to see the industry get better. But after a few years, if nothing changes, they will likely get fed up and leave the industry, as I did three years ago and as many others have done after me. If this continues to happen, the industry will never reach its full potential. You guys are a different audience than them. You are not a bunch of 45-year-old CEOs, and most of you don't come from remotely the same level of privilege. That said, I presume all of you in this room are a part of Silicon Valley in some way, and with that does come a level of privilege, no matter where you started from. Some of you here also have more privilege than others. And so it's on all of you to decide what to do with the privilege that you have. One way you can make an impact is to donate some of your time, talent, or money to organizations working to solve these problems already. Code 2040, Black Girls Code, Hack the Hood, or Hack Right Academy are some great places to start. Or you can try and get your company involved with organizations like Project Include. Another way to help the industry is to create personal projects of your own that make an impact. You all have the skills that can be applied to the industry's problems in unique ways. You can use code, design, photography, etc., to create work that shares your point of view, reveals new data or stories, or serves as a catalyst for conversation and change. And you don't have to do these projects alone. You are literally in a room right now surrounded by potential collaborators. If you are interested in doing work that makes an impact, here's my advice to you based on what I learned making techies. Before you settle on a project, think hard about your motivations and whether they check out. Have you picked a topic that you truly care about and that you personally can relate to? Are you willing to lose a shitload of time and money on it? Are you willing to stand behind your point of view? I've been wanting to do a project like this for 10 years, and almost a decade of my life experience directly prepared me for how I decided to approach techies. My best advice is to spend a good amount of time thinking hard about your own experience and how that may inform your work and the problems that you'd like to help solve. Choosing a subject that you have a personal connection to and expecting to lose considerable time and resources. If you care, it should be worth it. Play to your strengths and the skills that you do best. If you're a photographer, do a photo project. If you're into video, do a documentary. If you're into data, figure out new creative ways to present it. If you love print, make a zine or a book. If you're a super connector, do an event series or a meetup. To make your project even stronger, find people in this room who care about the same thing and who are great at something you're not and figure out a way to collaborate. In my case, having Alonzo Felix do all the design and Martha Schumann do the web development made the web experience a million times better than if I had tried to do the website myself. I was only good at GeoCities. If your project involves subjects, be respectful of the people that you work with and their time. Do your best to minimize what you require of them. They are busy people, and they are being generous to give their time to you. In my case, I needed to interview and photograph my subjects, but I planned all the logistics to require as little of their time as possible. Turns out, if I did the interviews before the photo shoots and gave people the option to do them via Google Hangout, the only in-person time that was required was coming by my house for 20 minutes for a quick photo shoot. You can also find ways to make you, sorry, you should also find ways to make participation worth their time. People deserve some sort of compensation for being involved. And while financial, financial compensation isn't always possible, you can alternatively trade your skills or other resources in a way that feels fair. 
In my case, it was giving them a free portrait shoot. Maybe in your case, it would be offering free consulting, design services, or web development in exchange for their time. Just talk to your subjects and make sure that whatever you're offering feels fair to them. Done is better than perfect. Most of you have probably worked at a startup or tech company, and it's helpful to treat your projects the same way. You have to throw perfectionism out the window. If you spend too much time worrying about doing everything right, you'll probably never get the project done. Figure out how to work quickly and efficiently, and don't be scared of launching an MVP. In my case, that meant committing to a three-month timeline, publicly announcing a launch date to hold myself accountable, and working 10 to 15 hours a day with no days off until launch, and having no friends and eating every meal at my computer. I also had to be OK with launching a really rough product full of bugs and typos. I know there are still typos, thank you, in order to commit to the launch date. But at the end of the day, the bugs and typos didn't really matter. The project itself mattered. Lastly, stand behind your work. Launching important work is hard. You put your time and soul into something you care about, and you put it out into the world for people to potentially rip apart. Important work is polarizing. People will criticize you, and some people will absolutely hate whatever you represent. But if you believe in the work that you're doing and your motives are in the right place, you can't let it get to you. Remember, you're doing good work. It's important, and it's helping move tech culture forward. And if you guys end up doing projects in this space, please share them with me so I can help spread the word. I'd like to close out with a quote from my project by Victor Roman. How can we measure someone's accomplishments without recognizing that not everyone starts in the same place at the, you know, on the racetrack? Some people start a mile or two back, and then when they don't finish in first place, we ask, well, you didn't do very good, when the reality is they ran faster and they ran longer than any of those other people, the person who ran first place. They just started at a different location, you know, and I think that's an important part of this conversation, you know, about what is that mile or two back? What makes up that distance? Thanks, guys. Okay, so techies, come up here. Where are you? Techies, techies, techies. So there's going to be a little group of techies up here with me, and we're going to open it up to Q&A, and feel free to share an experience. Ask a question to anyone. This way, come, come, come. This way. Do we need chairs? How do you guys feel? You want to sit or you want to stand? You can stand with me. You can come over here. OK, so we're going to run around with mics. If you guys just want to raise your hand, if you have a question, you can ask just the general group or a specific person. I, I very much enjoyed your project, so thank you for doing this. Um, I didn't notice much in the age over 50 in your what you presented today, and, and I know you, you said you did cover that, so can you or the group talk about their experiences with age, working with people over 50, and job hunt, and tech in general? Yeah, I mean, I can go into what I learned um, talking to people. There is a lot of frustration in the over 50 crowd around ageism, and it's interesting. There's a, there's a guy in the project, Kent Brewster, who works at Pinterest, who says he can remember the specific moment when ageism became a thing, and it was when Mark Zuckerberg did his kind of famous speech a million years ago at this point that said, like, young people are just smarter. And, um, and that maybe sent some ripples out into the industry. Um, I interviewed people that said that, you know, people don't want to hire people that feel like their mom. And it's just, it's been, it was really tough to hear what people are going through in terms of you know, the bias that they're facing, things like that. People don't believe that they're capable of contributing to the industry. Um, and yeah, if you want to share any of your stories too, that would be interesting to hear. I don't know if you guys have experiences personally as being over 50, but that may be all I can share at this point. I, um, I moved here around 2013, and the start of I. I work for, um, it was mostly young people. It was like a really small startup. Um, and then I, we moved um, and we were hired by GM. And now we're like, I went to Detroit and I'm meeting with this very, very different crowd, but that has like a lot of power and I'll, they're involved in a lot of decision making. And I think that's that's been interesting. It's been a few months, but it's really, um, I don't know, I feel like in this 
very like grown up meeting. I was like, I'm 25. I, then everyone was like over 40 and it felt like a baby. But at the same time, it's like really, it was really nice. It was really cool for me to be listening to their opinions and how they work on the decision making for like things that they do that impact like the world. So that's been my experience working with um, older people than me. That's just like a recent thing. And I will say, if you haven't yet, or for anybody here, if you want to learn about a very specific type of experience, uh, the project is sortable by filter. So you can basically, you could click over 50 or whatever it is that you want to uh, check out, and you can find every story in the project that covers that topic, which is really nice for people wanting to find stories they can relate to. Next. Over here. Um, I have a question. I was just wondering how everyone deals with issues when they come up. If you feel like there's some, like, if you don't get hired at a job that you, like, feel like, how do you deal with that situation when you're like, I think this was because of this? Like, do you say something? Do you just kind of, like, how do you dissipate that anger? And, like, do you say anything about it? Um, I work in the games industry, and I've felt more times than not that the reason I didn't qualify as a culture fit had a lot to do with who I am and what kinds of games I, I play in my personal time, which does not affect how well I can do software. So I, I relate to that a lot, and part of it is now that I've been through the interview process enough times and know what to look for, I can interview back and, and say, you know what, I'm not a good culture fit or you're not a good culture fit for me. But honestly, it's hard and it sucks and it's okay to be angry and it's okay to, you know, go home and eat ice cream or have a beer or whatever because it's, it's not an easy thing to deal with and, and it's just indicative of the problem that um, the culture has with somebody different. I can add a comment. I think for me, something that I've learned to do is to be brave enough in that moment. You know when that happens. When you're sitting there with them, you can feel it. What I've learned is to actually bring it up. Like, I don't, I don't know how you can do that because it differs for everyone, but in whichever way you can, in your own words, in your own language, bring it up. Because those are the moments that matter. Because if you walk out of there, the moment's gone. And you can't write them an email. They're going to think, you know, otherwise, but, or think something differently. I think something that I've learned is that deal with it immediately. And, and that, that takes a little practice, even, even by yourself at home, um, just learn, learn the language that, that's comfortable to, for you. Uh, yeah, just one other thing to, to throw out there is just to remember that you are, you're not just your own voice, but you're the voice for everybody else that looks like you, that may sound like you, uh, that might have the same orientation a, as you. So if you don't speak up for yourself, at least speak up for, for them. I screwed up and forgot to have them intro themselves. <laughs> Do you guys want to go down the line and say who you are and what you do and maybe what inspired you to sign up for a project like this? Um, I'm Grecia Garcia. I'm from Mexico. And what really inspired me to this project was the fact that I don't see a lot of Mexican people in this industry. I have worked with Mexican-American people, but they are... Um, they're in a really like white people culture because they're here and they're they had like a different privilege than I did, and I don't consider that they're like Mexican roots. You know, like it's it's just different. Um, not everyone that's Mexican American. I'm just talking about like the specific person I worked with. Uh, <laughs> Yes, and it's been one person that I've worked that's, that comes from like a Mexican background. And I was interested in both telling my story and know about other Mexican people that are working here. I'm Wes O'Hare, I'm a product designer over at Dropbox. And the thing that drew me to, the, to this project is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm biracial. 
And uh, I don't see a lot of people that look like me uh, just in general and especially in tech. And so uh, it, I just thought it would be like really cool thing to to help this project actually come alive. Uh, I'm Jess. I am an engineer at GSN Games. Um, I joined this project because working in the games industry, especially in the engineering side of things, there's less than 4% representation of women and it can feel really lonely. And for a long time, I really forgot that I even had a voice and felt like a total imposter in my job and in my own skin. So this was a really neat way to kind of open up about some of those experiences and really kind of overcome my, my inner imposter. imposter. My name is Fernando, and funny enough, there's two Mexicans up here. <laughs> I, was, I was born in Mexico, and I never imagined that I would be here, for one thing. Um, but the thing that drew me was um, the, the small number of Mexicans that are in tech and, um, and out and comfortable. Um, and those were the two factors that really led me to, to be here um, because it, it has been difficult and I've had to do things on my own to, to fix some of those problems. Um, not problems, see, that there goes the thinking. I, I saw them as problems, but they're not problems. Um, and so that's why I'm here. And I'm a visual designer at Skype. Okay, back to questions. So, um, this is sort of for you guys, but also for everybody that has sort of answered questions. How do people with different backgrounds within tech, do you feel that as you have had more years under your belt in tech, that it's become, you felt more accepted or less accepted because not only are you growing older, but also having um, diversity, like personal diversity stuff? Or do you feel like the experience within the industry makes you feel that whatever differences that you have feel lessened? That's a good question. I think the diversity has increased for sure. Um, I started in Chicago and I moved here seven years ago. Um, and I read some of the reviews about the piece and they were, some were pretty, some people were pretty upset. And I feel that um, more people of color and, and different backgrounds have have started working in the industry, and I think that that's obviously amazing. Um, so I've seen an increase, um, so I, I think that that's good. I don't know if that's an answer to your question. But. So I have a really specific um, experience when I was transitioning to a beer company that here in California, and it's the only place I've lived other than my hometown, um, I felt very accepted and people were like excited, like, oh, you're Mexican, like we're every, everyone, like there's many Mexican people and I've met a lot of like really amazing um, people that come from Mexico too. But when I transitioned to a bigger company in a really different environment, which is um, in like a north, um, northern city, um, they were re like the culture just there was really, really different and I am, I'm under this really specific working visa and I'm really, I'm really informed about everything. I'm really paranoid. And I just like, I know if I transition to another company, I don't have to go back to Mexico. I just need to um, do some paperwork um, and whatever, like I, I'll just get my visa. So when I was transitioning, they, the, their attorney wanted me, he was insisting every other day for me to go back to Mexico. And I was under treatment and he was like, no, you need to go back to Mexico. I'm like, really, like, I had to quote it the law for them to accept that I didn't have to go back to Mexico in order to make, to get my visa. And that it was like just a ridiculous situation. And it took three weeks for me to convince the guy. And those three weeks, like my team had already started in the new job, so I basically like lost a whole paycheck because the attorney didn't want to like make a change. But it was like in Michigan, like I learned that the that period that the culture is just so much different, and I'm used to like really nice people here in California, and like it's it's not the same. Like I was being like really naive, like oh my god, like America is awesome, and like <laughs> you know like. 
I mean, California is pretty amazing, and I think the country is really good overall. But yeah, I mean, that was the first time that I that I learned that I was being really naive about the world. <laughs> Back here. Hey, um, my name is Denzel. One, thank you all for doing this project, being an inspiration to pretty much everyone in this room. Um, I think that goes without saying, but for me personally, I'd love to thank you all. Um, to since doing this project, you all have put yourself in a public spotlight, which is both really amazing and really scary, I'm sure, as you have kind of gone through your work experience. So after doing this project, after I guess still living it, um, do you feel that your responsibility to the places that your work has changed in terms of being a representative of diversity and inclusion in tech? And what has that experience been like? Have people expected more of you or has it kind of washed over? Um, I, I guess I'd just like to hear what has changed for you in your life since you have done this and what do you feel like people's expectation of you has been? Yeah, uh, for me, uh, you know, I, I kind of feel like now, now the, the the burden is is also on me now that I've put my face to this project, um, and so uh, you know, different meetings that I might be in at work, whether we're talking about recruiting or hiring, um, like like I know I have to, to, like I was saying earlier, be that be that voice, um, and so it's it's a nice like uh, accountability feature. <laughs> Uh, but but it's also uh, but it, it it has also like empowered me to to actually speak up on on certain issues and uh, just gives me like a you know like another level of confidence when it comes to this type of stuff. How about you guys? Yeah, um, for me, I actually published an article last October that gained a fair bit of traction on LinkedIn. So this was kind of the second time I had done that, and. Um, it was both another means of accountability for me as well as a way for me to actually connect with people in the outer circles of my network who read my interview, read my article, and, and wanted to get introduced to me. So it's actually been a really great way to connect with other women, particularly in the games industry, who we have mutual connections through. And I've met so many incredible women who have had um, troubles in games, troubles in tech, and it's been really empowering. People come to me for advice on, on things that I said in my interview but were never actually published. And it's like, hey, I can, I can actually relate to this really well. And <laughs> it's, been, um, it's just been a really great networking, networking tool. Uh, I don't have coworkers, so. Um, <laughs> but yeah, obviously my life has changed a little bit since it came out. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because like when I first decided to do this, I wasn't like, I'm going to do a diversity project and call it a diversity project. It was more like, I'm going to do some self-therapy by introduce or by talking to 100 people and like do this interview photo project and just happen to focus on people who aren't straight white dudes. And I had no idea how big it would get or how many people it would resonate with. I didn't know that I would get so many applications, um, but obviously it uh, was needed. And I've, I have over 900 applications at this point, so it's very obvious that there is a, a huge market for people just wanting to talk and share their story, and people feel like they can. You know, I didn't feel like anyone could share their story when I worked in tech, but it feels like people are now feeling more comfortable with being open and speaking up, and that's really special. And so I totally plan to just do 100 people, launch it as a photo project, go back to running my own business, uh, but there's obviously uh, a responsibility now that I have to not do 100 or not do 900. Uh, I would die, but like do more, you know, and not end it at just 100. Um, hi. Uh, uh, when I first saw the website and, and read uh, some, some profiles, I gotta say uh, um, uh, um, it is. Very, uh, very uh, uh, inspiring, and uh, uh, it gives me uh, 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 a lot of hope uh, uh, about uh, about uh, about what I want to do. Um, uh, how do you guys overcome uh, uh, overcome um, all those doubts and uh, people saying, "I know you can't do this, you can't do that." I mean, like, how do you guys 
overcome it? How do you guys uh, 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 um, uh, achieve and go uh, 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 and go higher and beyond? How do you guys do it? Um, for me, I'm sure this is different for everyone. I I think I personally I look at what I have done up until today, and I have a very non. Um, it's not related to tech, but um, two years ago I went to Burning Man, and I rented. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> but I had never driven a large vehicle. I'm a, I have a perfect driving record. It was a 30-foot RV. Um, and, and I thought, I'm, I can't do this, right? I, I just can't. I had a nightmare about it. But I trusted my driving record. I've never been in an accident. Why is that doubt there? So it's, it's just a fear, right? And so I think that we apply those things unknowingly to, to many other areas that, that are unfounded. And so for me, I, I ask myself, okay, is this real? And if it is real, what went wrong? And can I change it? Um, so so I, I just dissect the, those things into little pieces instead of looking at the whole big scary thing. I don't know if that changes for everyone, but... Um, pushing through is something that uh, I think defines probably most people in this room. One of the great TED Talks that I've, I've been watching a lot of TED Talks recently, one of the great ones that I've really enjoyed was a talk on grit as a measure and predictor of success rather than um, IQ or other things. And I think that really spoke to me a lot because the ability to, you know, reflect. And, and sometimes I, I think back on situations that I've been in where I haven't spoken up, especially with either job interviews or reviews or speaking with management. And sometimes it just makes me sick to my stomach. But the ability to wake up and still do what we do, I think, is indicative of that grit. And just learning to take a moment and appreciate that showing up is its own achievement sometimes is okay. And looking out for yourself and being safe is okay. And, and those are the things that we should be celebrating in ourselves and using as ammo to move forwards versus those fears and flashbacks that we, we see. Cool, thanks. We have a question back here. Hi, um, this question's for Helena, mostly. Um, so what was the sort of tipping point for you to sort of leave the industry, and what was the catalyst for starting up this project finally after planning it for such a long time? Oh, um, I mean, I was kind of bummed the whole time I worked in tech, even though I, like, learned a ton, like, super valuable. I don't regret it for a second working in tech. Um, I think in general... It just felt really isolating being in the industry, not just as like a blonde girl, but just as like someone who does like moved here with no money and never had money and got paid like half the salary of my male colleagues and couldn't like my bosses couldn't understand why I couldn't like buy a plane ticket and then expense it because I couldn't be like, I don't have $300 because you don't pay me enough and I eat ramen all the time. So like those, that's just like a tiny tip of the iceberg of my experience in tech. And eventually, like I've been shooting since I was six, but I stopped when I started working in tech. And then I picked up photo again as like a hobby that would make me happy to balance out being sad at work. And then I barfed out thousands of photos and then I rage quit my job and then I became a photographer. That's like the really quick version. Um, but I've never done a personal project before other than like snapping some snaps when I walk around or like, you know, travel or whatever. And so I've wanted to do a project of this format for a decade. Like, it's all I can think about, like libraries of human stories and how that could be utilized to solve problems or be relatable or, or I just knew it would be something really powerful, but I never knew what I would do it on the first time. And so I just, and I've also not had money or time till recently. And so then I just thought of it in December. I was like, San Francisco, I was meditating one morning, and, um, and it just came to my mind. I was like, oh, shit, like, this is the thing, because I'm, I'm, like, on the internet all the time. I'm, like, looking at Twitter. I, like, follow these conversations really closely. I'm basically, like, a little stalker in the corner that watches Silicon Valley all the time and just tries to keep tabs on what's going on, and it was very obvious that this cultural conversation was, like, rising and rising and boiling over, 
in a way that it had never been boiling over before. And I was like, you know, I'm not technically in tech anymore, but I do work in tech, and tech mostly pays my bills. And it feels really weird and fucked up to just sit here on Twitter and watch it go down. Like, maybe I need to contribute in some way that makes sense for me. Um, and that's how I decided to do the project. This is, yeah. Um, I've been recruiting in the tech industry for the past five or six years, and it's been amazing to see just kind of across the board the discussion come up and the context is a lot more top of mind for people and a lot more relevant and I think just a lot more important to a lot of the straight white guys that are running around, uh, which is great and it's been exciting. And I was just wondering for you guys, um, throughout your experience, either being on hiring panels or um, being part of the group discussion when it comes to deciding who to bring on, have you noticed any tactical or even just social strategies in encouraging diversity in hiring, hiring and getting people on board with that? Anyone? Um, I actually was on the Technical Recruiting Council at Zynga for about a year before I left. So one of the, um, I think, great things about Zynga was the hiring and the universal hiring mechanism we had. And for better or for worse, we had amazing people and we were really good at hiring them, even if they turned through and um, now we have the best alumni network that I've ever seen. <laughs> like when, when layoffs go down in the industry, all of the Zynga alums will put together a Google Doc of openings at their companies and, and be really forthcoming and it's amazing. So. Um, from that perspective, I think some of the things that went really well with hiring were the focus on objective feedback, not biasing each other with feedback after each individual interview. So you weren't allowed to see anyone else's feedback until you wrote your own, which I think helped a lot. Um, you weren't allowed to talk to the other interviewers before going into the next interview, so they couldn't really prejudice you against the next candidate. Um, one of the cool things that I saw on LinkedIn recently that I have never seen in my life but I got really excited about was a meme that was like Taylor Swift being like, walking into the interview saying, say you'll remember me, and I thought it was the coolest thing ever, and then I realized that was targeting recruiters and not me. And <laughs> it was a little bit depressing because I was really excited and I was like, yeah, I want to be confident and awesome going into an interview, but that's not talking to me. So I think... As a female engineer, I would love to see more things like that, you know, targeting specifically the less uh, prevalent demographics. Mike dudes, where you at? Hi, uh, I'm Corey. I'm a product manager at Shazam. Um, and I was, I guess, kind of a question and also a statement, um, I think, Privilege is unfortunately one of those things that's not talked about when you're growing up, but if you don't have it, you know it, and that's how you come to know about it. And I think for me, um, being in the place where I am right now in my life and waking up and being like, oh shit, I have all this privilege now, how do you deal with that intersection of coming from not having a lot of privilege to waking up and having more of it um, and realizing at the same time you still lack it sometimes? You should read Lucas Black's interview. She talks about this a lot, about guilt. And we go into guilt about like what it's like when suddenly you have money and yeah. you didn't have it before. And then suddenly you're in this different class of person. And there's this over, and it, it's funny because I've felt this a lot. And in this project, I discovered that other people feel it too. And it is like a pervasive feeling. I would say it's like the feeling I feel the most of any feeling ever right now, which is interesting. Um, so that's a very good interview to read if you are also feeling guilt, yeah. but you guys can. Yeah, for me, I think, um, I did a lot of work with the boys and girls clubs growing up and for me, that would be, that is my, and I still haven't done it, but that, that is the way that I would give back. Um, you do programs with them or, um, even a mentor program program. I mentioned this in my interview, um, because now the table turned and I'm, you know, at the other end and that's something that I could do. Yeah, um, last, last October, so since I got my, my first job at a startup, I was like committed to 
donate money to like kickstarted projects that I like that were Mexican, that were like international, that were like from kids that wanted to do something big, or in the other hand, um, families that were in need. So I did that for the first year. And last October, I hosted an event that I called Macrocosm, and it was a charity to help um, families in need. In that case, the first edition, it was my family because they didn't have money to come visit me when I was like under chemotherapy and all that stuff. So I wanted to do it not in a way like, hey, here's my GoFundMe, I have cancer, can you give me some money, please? So I tried to like do a thing where I have a lot of uh, friends that are artists. So I emailed all of the people that I knew and they donated a piece and we shipped it. And it was more like, um, uh, oh my God, I forgot the word. Ha, ha, auction, yeah. <laughs> it was more like a, a Facebook auction and it was really exhausting, but, and, and I, Honestly, like I didn't make that much money because I spent a lot of money on shipping, which I didn't account for. But <laughs> it felt good to help my family with like a thousand or two thousand dollars that like and I worked so hard on it. And it just felt good to like help my family come visit me because they, they just couldn't like come and visit me. I couldn't afford like to pay for the expenses. So I don't know, like just kind of like small projects like that. Um, for me, it helps if you if you have like a really solid why, like behind your career. So like for me, it's um, you know I want to become better, better so that I can help others become better. And so uh, it really doesn't matter about uh, what my salary is, what I know, what I don't know. Um, I'm I'm really just a, a steward of whatever resources that I that I might have, and my obligation is to just pass it along to to the next person. And also, they don't have to be huge, grand events. Like, I just did the AIDS life cycle with my friend Justin back there, uh, the life cycle ride. And that's an amazing organization. And that's, you know, it's giving back. So, just to jump in, because I have a mic in my hand. <laughs> Hi. Um, giving, giving feedback about others in your immediate, like, uh, like people you work with that you don't see get credit for things that they do often. Um, goes a very long way down the road. So who is next? <laughs> um, <clears throat> were there stories that impacted you but that you weren't comfortable sharing publicly? Um, I'm asking because I feel like it's really hard to share stories a lot of the time because people it makes you look bad. <laughs> and if people don't have the full context, it can actually go against you. So I'm curious, like, for you, including if there were people that you interviewed but w didn't want you to share certain stories or didn't even want to be interviewed but you thought it would be a good fit. Um, because I feel like the other side sort of misses that because there aren't specific sometimes. Um, I guess I can start. Um, well, fortunately, everybody wanted to be interviewed. Um, and I mean, it was interesting to me because, you know, like this historically has been really scary. Like you don't share these experiences because suddenly you're like on a blacklist or you're not getting hired or you could get fired or like there was not, it was not okay um, to share these experiences, like negative experiences at work or whatever. Um, and so I think it was very scary for a lot of people uh, to do these interviews and a lot of people shared things for the first time ever, like hadn't told their friends that they were telling me, which is crazy. And so, you know, that's a crazy, like, it's amazing. And, like, it was a really profound, intense experience, but also, like, you know, kind of scary that we're all kind of putting ourselves on this platter um, and launching it to the world. But I do think, like, five years ago, this project wouldn't have been doable because it just wasn't okay to share stories. And I think there's a handful of people in the last couple of years that really set the tone and showed that they could write a Medium post or they could just, like, finally share their story, it would cause a shitstorm on the internet. Like, they took the brunt of that. They took the criticism of that. But by doing that, they paved the way for us to be able to share our stories and not deal with as much backlash. So I think it was a lot about timing. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are a couple of people that shared stories with me that were, like, little chunks were anonymous. 
And so they're not in the project, but we talked about them. And I think also, and I'm going to use that as a direct example, I think by you not sharing those stories, they're keeping you in that place. Like it, it felt like a, such a, a growth spurt in some way by just simply talking about what we experienced. Is it some great secret? No. But for some reason, I held it close. And I don't know what that reason was, but maybe you should just let it out. Uh, I'm actually one of those crazy people that shared something that I'd never shared with anyone else. And um, I came home and like it was a great mechanism for me to uh, open up and actually talk to my husband about it who had never heard most of this stuff before. And it was just like this weight I'd been bearing for a long time and, and I wasn't really ready to publicly own that um, on the internet where things live forever, but um, it felt really good to talk about it. Uh, I mean, it was it, it's hard, but uh, it, it felt good to be able to talk about it, even if I don't like talking about it. <laughs> Next. Um, Mexican-American over here. No offense taken. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't work in tech anymore, um, but when I first moved to the city, I did. Uh, when I first moved here, I worked for like this large tech company, um, and obviously I was like the only Latino person there. Um, and I remember moving or going to the mission and then seeing kind of all these signs like die techie scum. And it felt kind of almost counterintuitive for me to like feel isolated in this tech world. And then also going to like my neighborhood and like the mission is like ground zero for gentrification. Um, and then kind of like having coworkers that want to go to Valencia Street and I wanted to go to Mission Street, like eating tacos or whatever. Like, it, it was different. It was weird, like, feeling kind of that adversity from, like, my own community. So, like, I just wanted to ask if you all felt anything like that. Like, you like you mentioned you were biracial. Like, I, since moving here, I have never gotten asked, like, what are you? Like, so many times in my life, like, are you Native American? Are you Argentinian? Are you French? Like, someone from Uzbekistan was like, oh, you look like us, too. <laughs> um, so, like, just kind of. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. For me, I haven't really had any, I guess, like backlash from a community. Uh, I, I do share the same experience. Uh, you know, I'm half black, uh, half Pacific Islander, and I've, I've gotten passed for everything, like Brazilian, I mean, Egyptian, whatever it is. But I don't know about you guys. Have, have you had experiences? Yeah, I felt, um, I think last year, really embarrassed to, like, I don't know if you're like in a, Uber or Lyft or whatever and to share that I was working in tech and that I was also Mexican because that it was like one or the other. It felt like like they would either like love me or hate me because I work in tech and then I'm like married to this white dude and like all like the judgment that it comes with. Um, and this project really helped me to like embrace that I just happened to work in tech. I'm sorry. Like it's, I don't know, it, it was a really weird transition period that, like, yeah, I'm Mexican and I also work in tech and, and I'm sorry about that. Like, I'm, I'm not rich, like, I'm not above you. If anything, I'm, like, below, I'm paying, like, a really high rent. Like, it's not, it's, it's not cool. It's, it's a job. Like, it's a job like any other, any other industry. I don't know. Did I answer? Just want to throw out, I've never seen this many Mexicans in tech in like the same 10 foot vicinity. So thank you guys. Uh, sort of on that note of this idea of gentrification identity, uh, I'm first generation high school and college Latina who works in tech. And I live in Redwood City. And I've seen, you know, crime go down exponentially because of gentrification and building a new downtown. Yet, I see many people who could be my mother, my cousin, my brother and sister getting evicted from their home and losing their livelihood and being unable to provide for their family thanks to you know, some tech company building right downtown or some condo demolishing culture in order to put up you know, units that don't offer low income housing. So how you know, do you guys deal with working in tech 
and you know acknowledging that there is a problem because 70% of people don't acknowledge there's a problem yet like living in that gray area where you know like you're part of it but you also like know that there's good in it a lot of people talk about that in the project for sure i interviewed a lot of locals or as not a lot, but I interviewed a considerable amount of locals in the project, and my big question was them. for them was like, what does it feel like straddling these two communities? Like, you are a local, you grew up here, yet you are also part of the community that's destroying your other community. Like, how is that for you? Um, and I feel like that question applied in many ways of like, what is it like being part of X privileged community tech and then X non-privileged community, be that community of color, immigrants, LGBT, that sort of thing. Uh, and there is no answer. It's like, it is complicated. Like, it just, it's a bad feeling, and it's complicated, and it sucks, and, uh, and all of us feel that way, that are straddling those two communities. I don't even, I don't think there was any concrete solutions that anyone has been able to come up with yet, which is a bummer, other than we, the people that are straddling the two communities understand that Need, things need to be done and more attention needs to be paid to San Francisco or like the actual local community. Um, and it's a matter of getting that awareness to people who just like don't think there's a problem. You know, that's my experience. A lot, Ed. a lot. Like, um, I don't know, I used to go to this place called Roosevelt Samala Parlor and they closed recently and they were really good. And I was like, damn, like, they closed because the rent was too high. And I was really bummed out by that. And one thing that I, as a designer, I was thinking about, like, I was like, I don't know, maybe, maybe this is so, this, this was like a really dumb idea, but it was like my way of helping being a designer. And I didn't do it because I don't have, like, a lot of time. But I was like, what if, like, a collective of, of designers get together and provide like some really cool branding to these places that are really small, owned by, like in the mission, like we go to this barber shop that's owned by Mexican people and provide them with like new branding and new like, um, like community management strategies to help them, um, you know, raise their value. But I just don't have that kind of time. Like it's, it's it really hurts because I wish I had time to do like branding while I'm working full time and doing side projects and you know like it's it's really it's really complicated. Hey, uh so I'm from North Carolina too. Hello. Um one thing I find interesting coming from like lower income backgrounds or even the East Coast, like how do you straddle being here in this competitive environment where you're always searching for more and then also figuring out how to translate whatever world we're in right now to wherever you came from or the people back home. I'm from Chicago and that's a very interesting question because whenever I go back to Chicago, it feels like a small town. And so I think I just shut it off. Like I don't try to translate anything because it's completely different. And yeah, the things that we talk about when we're out to dinner aren't things that people in Chicago talk about when they're out to dinner. So I, I personally don't know an uh, a answer to that. I, I think that with family, you can always relate to them. Friends are difficult. And it's interesting that you bring that up, but I've felt the same thing, and I don't know. The only, or the first time that like my family or people from home remotely understood what I was working for was when I shot George W. Bush, and they were like, oh! you're legit and I was like thanks uh, but they did not uh, they never understood what I did when I was in tech they didn't understand why I moved across the country they don't understand why I don't have kids like I live in the land of sin you know it's like it's I've given up on trying to like translate that um, even this project I'm sure like probably makes some of my family angry because it's like threatening their their fortress you know um, so I just don't bother um, and it's interesting, like, being on the East Coast, I'm sure you're, and probably many of you in the audience are acquainted with a mentality that's very different from Silicon Valley, in which, like, you have an idea. It's like, I want to do a giant project interviewing and photographing 100 people. The reactions that I would get from home are like, 
well, you can't do that. It's like, why, why would you do that? Like, how are you going to do that? There's no way. Like, why, why even bother? And then, or, you know, like a startup idea or anything, like I want to make like AI beer. And like on the East Coast, they'd be like, that's dumb. And in Silicon Valley, they're like, how can I help? Like, who can I introduce you to? You know, it's like, so that culture, you know, it's very different. And while like, maybe we're a little pie in the sky here at times, you know, I think that most of us are able to believe in ourselves just a tad more in this environment just because you don't have that culture of like pragmatic realism. It's just like totally like dreamland, but I think it enables us to at least believe in ourselves a tiny bit more. Back here. Are we okay on time? Hi. Hi. Let's do two more. Okay. So my question is, um, in an industry um, where we often feel like imposter syndrome or we feel like beat up, like day to day, like what advice do you give yourselves to like just make it through like that moment? Always be constructive. The, um, one of the things that I've found when I've been doing a lot of research around the data around imposter syndrome is that there's a huge gap between positive constructive feedback and negative constructive feedback. So those of us that are always in that growth and learning mindset are looking to improve ourselves and we seek out constructive feedback and that's often negative. Listen to positive feedback even if it's not constructive and be constructive with yourself. Tell yourself positive, constructive feedback. This was a cool thing, and this was why. This was a cool process, and this was why. And, you know, be, be constructive. <laughs> if it's any consolation, I still don't feel like I know what I'm doing, so. <laughs> I guess I'm the last questioner of the evening. I just want to share my experiences because I have a lot of situations that are against me. I am an older broad. I speak with a strange accent, and I didn't come into coding till I was very late in my life. So I remember my first job. I was a scrum master, and I had a team of engineers. So they were discussing stuff, and I tried to pipe in, asking questions, and the Reaction I got was, what does she know? She's a scrum master. So at that time, GitHub was very new, uh, new, and I have a GitHub account where I put all my code in. So I turned to them and I said that, do you have a GitHub account? <laughs> and, I, and then they, they turned around, like, what's GitHub? And I'm like, well, there you go. You should have an account because, you know. So, <laughs> and one thing I... I I wanted to share is uh, the lessons that I learned in my life is that never run away from who you are. And I have a lot of biases because I speak with, like I said, I don't speak like an American. One day I saw in a meeting, I said, I use a word. And one of my coworkers said that, oh, Angeline, your vocabulary just astounds me. Oh my! So own. I call him on that. Don't be chicken. Always call them on that behavior. If not, it will perpetuate. So you know what I said to him? I said that, are you saying that because I'm Chinese? Silence. Woo. So never run away from yourself. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. OK, guys, it's 8.53. That gives us about six and a half minutes to drink our last beer. I don't think that's going to happen. To say goodbye to everybody. And do you guys want to come up on stage for a second before we conclude? Do you have anything else? Okay, thank you guys.